Race Relations in Northern Ireland, Past, Present and Future, a film and podcast series from the MME Council. Part 4, Rising to the Challenges, with Mark Donoghue, Traveller Community Campaigner, Ola Sobierai, Stronger Together Network, Liz Griffith, Law Centre NI, and Drew Michael, Queen's University Belfast. Presented by me, Morris McCartney. The day that I started working, as mentioned, the Race Relations Order came out. Mark Donoghue. Um, it was the first time travellers were recognised anywhere here, or anywhere in these islands, in Britain or on the island of Ireland. So we're the first part of anywhere in the world to be seen as an ethnic or racial group, uh, which was a good starting point for me, starting in a travel organisation. Ola Sobierai. And Stronger Together Network is a network of organisations and individuals uh, interested in working in the fields of ethnicity, diversity and equality. Liz Griffith. So I see my job and you know, the role of the Law Centre within this migration justice project is we are trying to dismantle as much of the hostile environment as we can. Drew Michael. My name is Drew Michael. I am a research fellow at Queen's University Belfast in the School of Politics. What challenges, old and new, do we face? My name is Mark Donoghue. I'm a member of the Traveller community from West Belfast. Um, my family have been here, my, my mother's family, my father's family have been here for since they were born here, they're, um, my mother's family were born here. Because um, a lot of people have this perception that Irish travellers are from the south because of our accents, because of a perceived uh, southern accent. Uh, travellers have been here for centuries, um, including my mother's people, the Roman Gypsies who came over from Wales. Um, so I have my background in terms of working with the traveller community. I started working with uh, Belfast Travellers Education Development Group, uh, which is an organisation which was, <clears throat> excuse me, based on Dublin uh, Travellers Education Development Group, which now became, has now become Pave Point, uh, which is the national organisation in Dublin or in the south. Uh, so we, I started work there in 1997 on the day uh, the race relations order uh, came out in Northern Ireland. So it was, it was a good, um, it was good timing. Um, before that, uh, it was perfectly legal to discriminate, racially discriminate against travellers, Chinese people, Indian, Pakistani and um, African Caribbean community. So it was perfectly legal for shop owners, pubs, restaurants, employers to say no travellers, no Chinese, no blacks. So um, because the attitude here was there's no there was no racism. It was just sectarianism. In the last three years as a research fellow, I have been working on a project called the Exclusion and Mid-Inclusion Dilemma, uh, EAI Dilemma, which looks at marginalized groups who in power sharing post-conflict societies like Northern Ireland and my other case study, Lebanon. We seek to understand in power sharing societies that are employing this type of governance to aid or manage a conflict between two, shall we call them, indigenous groups, in Northern Ireland's case, uh, the PUL, the Protestant uh, Unionist Loyalist Community, and the Catholic Republican Nationalist Community. However, in these kinds of uh, power sharing agreements, what we have seen is that those who are expressly included will almost always lead to implicit or formal exclusion of people who aren't recognized by those groupings. So in Northern Ireland, that may include um, newcomers in my research, particularly looking at migrants and refugees and asylum seekers, but other groups as well, including uh, women, people who uh, seek to improve the, the status of women in politics and generally, also those who um, identify along non-political lines like Green Party representatives, 
And then other groupings included, of course, that may not that may be ethnic or racial as well. So, well, uh, in general, stronger to stronger together uh, uh, as a network uh, identifies issues that are important uh, for uh, ethnic minorities uh, in Northern Ireland at the time, and 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 tries to push those forward. So, uh, for a long time, and that hasn't uh, hasn't changed. It's been health inequalities experienced and uh, and. Uh, f- by ethnic minorities. Along the way, there have, have been other uh, the- thematic projects such as policy and participation uh, development. Uh, uh, and then with, uh, with the Brexit vote, uh, the rights of EU citizens and their families in, uh, in the UK post-Brexit have, become, uh, have come to the forefront. And especially in Northern Ireland, as we're in such a curious position uh, uh, in between uh, in the UK, but also in between the UK and uh, uh, and Ireland. So uh, to drive this agenda forward, we started working in 2000, probably 17, uh, on the issue and to campaign and lobby for for the rights. And then when the Home Office introduced their EU settlement scheme, which really is supposed to protect and secure the immigration status and the rights of EU citizens in the UK, uh, we formed a partnership with uh, our 10 of our member organizations to uh, to bid for funding to uh, to really deliver the scheme in, in Northern Ireland, to make sure that as many people take up the scheme and register with the scheme uh, as possible. So we have been uh, working on that since 2019. Uh, and uh, we are one of the two organisations funded in Northern Ireland by the Home Office to to work on the EU settlement scheme. And so far, we have supported well over a third of the applications that came from Northern Ireland. I think by the end of December, there was around uh, eighty thousand applications uh, that came from made in Northern Ireland, uh, and we contributed to 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 about a third of well over a third of that. The infrastructure in Northern Ireland for immigration advice is really, really weak. You know, the hostile environment is you know, a, a policy that was devi- de- devised at Westminster. And because immigration law um, is an accepted matter, that means it applies here too. And so you know, on a local level, we are feeling the effects of the hostile environment <laughs> policy. So, you know, together across coalitions, across the Refugee and Asylum Forum and others, you know, we are trying to um, dismantle and get rid of aspects of that policy um, or to try and um, kind of hold it back. You know, perhaps now is a difficult time to push for genuinely progressive change. But if we can hold back some of that hostile environment stuff, then we're doing we're doing okay. Uh, and then suddenly, with the arrival of Brexit and uh, and the new immigration regime, uh, those eighty thousand people at least uh, that have not been subject to immigration control have now become subject to immigration control, and uh, on all the new arrivals on top of that. So, uh, so this is uh, this is something that uh, that we're going to take forward uh, or needs to be taken forward after the project, the EU settlement scheme project, is finished. Uh, But for the last two years, we've been working tirelessly uh, on uh, supporting especially vulnerable people uh, to to access the scheme. What strategies should we pursue in rising to those challenges? So if you're a different, if you are different or an other from either of those two two communities, with the overarching existential questions of whether or not Northern Ireland remains a part of the UK or a part uh, or reunifies with Ireland, depending on your perspective, it's very hard to table any issues. So informally, for a start, we have to move the society on the ways by eroding barriers between those two communities. That can happen in a number of different ways. However, for those who are here, who are who are others, is about like making sure that their voices are heard on the public stage. Um, we saw during the George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protest, the fact that at least, whereas we can talk about the institutional, the problematic institutional response to those protests, we saw the fact that there was actually a space and a conversation in Northern Ireland that highlighted a significant demographic that did not agree with either of those two pillars, or maybe did not identify with either of those two pillars. Maybe ideologically they might agree. However, they felt that there was a space 
and an impact on their on their community that needed to be brought to light. And these issues informally showing that there is another community or other communities or a constellation of other communities that belong to the province, that have a stake in the province's well-being and prosperity. So some of the other examples of the work that, that we have, as a sector have been able to secure over the years is um, getting free English classes for all asylum seekers and refugees. And obviously the ability to speak English is so important in terms of integration and you know, access to decent employment things. Um, also um, managed to secure independent guardianship for unaccompanied asylum seeking children. And we were the first jurisdiction within the UK to get that in law. So we were very pleased about that. Um, and we played a key role, I think, in, in pushing for Northern Ireland to participate in the Syrian refugee resettlement scheme. You know, we were, we were delighted to, to be able to play, that, to play that role and that a number of organizations from the voluntary and community sector are involved in, um, in, in, in that scheme's operation. And we're very, you know, we're very proud to be able to, to play a role there. And what we found is that um, for political for political parties, excuse me, um, in Northern Ireland, there's a difficulty in how to outreach to these to others who may not have an ideological stake in or skin in the game. How do you, if you're a party that is fervently, uh, um, or your entire modus operandi is the protection or promulgation of a certain identity with a political goal? It makes it very, very difficult if you're someone who is caught between these two pillars to make a political decision, because these are the dominant parties in Northern Ireland. Um, so do you um, make a decision and vote for one of these parties, because knowing that that may um, limit your social interactions with another particular part of the community, which you might not want to do, and nor would I recommend that everyone has the right to be able to, to mobilize along socially and politically along whatever lines they like. However, the fact is, is that those two issues have, have um, permeated into how outreach into potential potential and new constituencies for political parties, rather than just continually replicating and strengthening within um, the nationalist or unionist communities and outflanking um, their intra-unionist or nationalist rivals for uh, dominance within the community, there should be more outreach towards um, those who don't identify with either, either, side of the, either side of the coin and who have and who have interests that go beyond the constitutional question of the, of the province, and that's very difficult for parties to do. But we have seen um, we have seen attempts by a number of different uh, parties to do so. I mean, of course, um, the growth in of not or other parties, as we have labeled them, in the in the council elections was a positive because we've we've and certainly seeing the percentage losses of um, the dominant parties in those actually signals to me that there is a growth of, an, of a community in Northern Ireland that is also considering um, non-ethnic issues as its, primary, as its primary concern. And it's up to political parties to try and um, appeal to them by modifying their, their discourse and modifying their policies as well. So, in Northern Ireland, there's a racial equality strategy um, that was 2015 to 2025. So we're bang slap in the middle of that strategy. And within that strategy, you know, ministers state their commitment to creating a better society that is you know, like based on the concept of integration and cohesion. And, you know, obviously that's something that the Law Centre would welcome, but against that, you know, um, commitment from the ministers. You know, we, we have the, the notion of immigration control, which is driven by Westminster, and immigration control, you know, by definition, is based on the concept of exclusion. You know, immigration control is about, you know, who do we allow in and who do we keep out? So, you know, you know it's, it's great that ministers here are committed to a policy of inclusion and integration. 
but you know we, we really need to collectively think how do we address you know the the exclusion that follows immigration control um, and within the racial equality strategy you know there are there are frustrations in the, the sector and you know rightly so about um, some of the delays in, in implementing it you know because uh, you know the, a strategy um, is only valuable if it's implemented um, and you know they, as, a, as a framework you know it, 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 it's a very positive framework you know but um, now halfway into the lifespan of that strategy you know it, it has to be implemented and it has to work for everyone. There has been a, tra a traveller and Roma strategy uh, in the south already, uh, it's from 2017 to 2021 and I don't know whether that has been successful but it's highlighted the issues regarding um, uh, service provision, education, accommodation and so on. There's also been one launched in 2019 in Britain uh, for the traveller and gypsy community but there has, uh, there's no there's no planned traveller and gypsy strategy here. I wonder just in terms of the, you know, that there's the race, the racial equality strategy, which is yeah, we, problems already. So is, it's, yeah, I, it's like, that's too broad. We, we would get lost in that. And that's why we always called um, on the executive uh, to have a separate uh, strategy um, okay. to look at the specific uh, issues that we have on our, on our face and because we're, they're very unique to all, to us and we will get lost in, in that overall strategy. Um, there's a few other issues that we have, as mentioned, we don't have a, a, a regional travel organisation here, um, like in the south and like in over in uh, Scotland, England and Wales. Um, we have regional small uh, organizations that it's mostly made up of settled people with settled boards, settled staff that work for travelers rather than work with or, or are traveler led. Uh, so that's one of the things that we'd like to see. Uh, we were working on that as mentioned earlier. Um, we don't have, as well as the South, they have a traveler history month uh, just to showcase uh traveler talent tra um traveler you know the arts um achievement in education health sciences it's the same in in, in britain but we don't have anything here in the north we're, we're like the poor cousin of britain and southern ireland it's just like we're always on the back burner i wonder if the events of last year in terms of the Black Lives Matter protests uh, have helped to reinvigorate that debate. I know you're, you're talking about some frustrations with the pace. Uh, certainly that has come out quite clearly through those demonstrations and the response to them and so forth. Yeah, and for, for sure, all the, um, you know, the, the, the Black Lives Matter protest has, has really helped to, to shine a light um, on um, a, a number of issues here, um, not least, you know, delays in implementing the racial equality strategy, but also things like highlighting that we still do not have a refugee integration strategy in place. You know, it has been years in the making, and yet, you know, it, it doesn't exist. So we do not have a, an agreed blueprint, if you like, for you know how we are working to ensure that refugees are fully integrated in society, so you know um, th those um, that, that that campaign that movement have you know has, has really helped to shine a light on that and you know to get questions asked up at you know the assembly um, and to draw attention to um, unfortunately to failures within the system. So we, there's a lot of things that, that needs changing here in the North. Um, um, there's a lot of misconceptions um, of our community. There's a whole notion that travelers don't want to be integrated. That's complete nonsense. We want to be integrated, not assimilated, but integrated. We want, um, we want to live alongside the community, 
but also we want to be separate. If travelers, some travelers, over half the, pers half the population of travelers are living in satellite accommodation, where I'm, I'm living in the city centre at the moment. I'm happy, but my parents are living on the Glen Road. Um, so they need to be accommodated. Um, um, there's a lot of, uh, st still a lot of racism and m prejudice towards my community. And there's a lot of generalizations that, uh, like Irish travelers, you mostly find them in nationalist areas. And, and you will also find Romani gypsies. Um, the majority, but not all, you'll find them in unionist areas. So a lot of them call themselves British gypsies um, and Irish gypsies. My mother calls herself an Irish Romani, but her family friends from years ago, they would call themselves um, British uh, Romani gypsies. And they would take the bunting out every 12th of July. So people don't know these little bit, you know, these little, um, these little things about the Irish traveller and, and, and the, the Romani gypsy community. Um, there are different origins. Uh, gypsy is used in a, in, a, in a derogatory way, but my mother is very proud to call herself a Romani gypsy. Um, gypsies uh, originate in north northwestern uh, India. They started migrating over a thousand years ago. Um, they landed in Scotland around about five hundred years ago. So, Irish travellers are an indigenous ethnic nomadic group that go back between a thousand and two thousand years here. So we have an old, our culture is an old culture. Our language is said to be um, related to pre-Celtic uh, communities here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all those things that people are not aware of. I am my own language. I speak my father's language very brokenly. And so I speak bits of my mother's language, Romanes, uh, which relates to Sanskrit and Punjabi. Um, my father's language relates to old Irish Gaelic, but it's still a separate uh, language. So there's a lot of things that people don't know about the travel community. And one of the uh, recommendations that you would have, and it sounds like it's it's very necessary, is, is a kind of a, an education program, if you like, and a kind of a showcase yeah. for all that. The history yeah, of a, the culture. A Traveller Pride Month, which they have in the South, and a Traveller Focus Week. We used to have a Traveller Focus Week here back in the early uh, noughties. Or, yeah, it was 2001, 2002. And then funding dried up uh, from the local government. So we'd like to see that we would stay. In the South, uh, since it took, it took the South 20 years to update their legislation or their view in terms of Irish travellers. We had legislation to rec formally recognise us as an ethnic or racial group. But in the South, it was only, I think it was only five, five years ago. Um, what was it, a year? Five years, a couple, a couple of years anyway. Uh, that travellers were formally recognised by Enda Kenny as an ethnic group. Whereas before that, um, they were only seen as a social group. Mm -hmm. But now, since that, that recognition, the South are now going to be, uh, within their educational curriculum, Irish travellers' history and culture will be taught in all schools as part of the curriculum. I think from, uh, well, mostly from when I had children uh, and uh, when it was time for them to to, to go to school uh, and we considered kind of school choices and what we're close to, uh, I was absolutely astounded that the um, integrated education was uh, as young as it was, only dated to maybe 10 years prior to when my daughter needed to go to school. And I felt so thankful that it actually did exist because otherwise I would be left with no choice because uh, we well, obviously come from, well, not, not obviously, but we're uh, being from a, a multicultural or a, a background where we don't 
quite belong uh, either to well, I'm kind of against faith schools uh, uh, as such were not that very religious so the maintained sector didn't really appeal uh, but neither did the state one mostly because it was in, in opposition to the uh, maintained and I was so, uh, so grateful and so thankful that the integrated uh, system uh, sector uh, existed so I think this is really where um, and then to me it was an, a no-brainer thinking like well how everybody asks me what to do to you know to stop the uh, the segregation and, and, and the communities being divided and that at the same time you divide them at the age of three when they when they go to, to work so if you divide them for 12 years of education how do you expect them to come together you know as, as adults uh, so I think that is uh, that is really the uh, where the focus should be to to promote integrated education and secularized education uh, uh, for, for all because even integrated uh, education even though it does provide for a kind of you know mixed on no, no religious it's still it's still based on the Christian ethos so it's not secular enough uh, for me or uh, secular enough uh, it's as, not as, uh, in, as integrated as, enough um, it's not I integrated guess. enough because it's just um, yeah. Uh, and especially within the last 10, 10 years, I think there's been uh, uh, the diversity in Northern Ireland increased uh, and uh, it's diversified even, even further in terms of uh, religions and uh, mm -hmm. colours and where people's backgrounds. And uh, so that, uh, that I think should be incorporated far more into the uh, education and curriculum. So I think that's, for, if, I, if I was to choose one single thing to focus on, that, that would be it. Uh, but generally increasing diversity and reflecting diversity of the people uh, everywhere. So in workforces and, uh, and this is within decision makers, within service providers uh, at, at every level. Uh, but there's, uh, I think education is, is the key. So that's the, the first thing that I would want to see. Uh, sort of a, a full spectrum integration, not just the, the traditional communities, the two traditional main communities in Northern Ireland, but uh, across the whole spectrum. Very, very much so. Uh, of course, the, the, the two traditional communities, that's, there's still a lot of work to be done there, and uh, I wouldn't dismiss the, I wouldn't say there's that that's not important. It, uh, it certainly is. There's a, is a lot of work in education to, uh, to uh, that, uh, and, and a, a kind of healing process that is not complete. Uh, 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 but I think opening, uh, opening the green and orange uh, green and orange debate to uh, to other colors and uh, and other cultures certainly would help and, and it's important to do uh, to 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 go away from this Catholic Protestant and other because uh, this other uh, if uh, when all the uh, when all the other come together it it, uh, it, uh, it might turn out that it's it's not so insignificant uh, uh, it's, it's quite it's quite a big part and chunk of uh, of life here. Uh, personally, on for me, it, it was normalized. My mother is is from Belfast, and my father is from Beirut. So it was something that I I had grown accustomed to without realizing it. Realizing that you know you live in a city that has certain areas um, that are for certain prescribed communities one community lives in this area and you learn to navigate the division. Um, I come from, you know, a, a family, a personal family that always um, professed non-sectarian or non-aligned or other politics of others. And that was helpful for me growing up. But then similarly, I think that also, and I spent most of my schooling was mostly in Belfast. I was while outward appearing to be white and, and, and partially ginger, I could mostly pass for a non-Arab, but my name and, uh, and accent usually set me apart. And for most non-Northern Irish, they'll probably just hear a Northern Irish accent, but anyone, any taxi driver or anyone in Northern Ireland never assumes that I'm from Northern Ireland. They always assume that I'm from somewhere else because they, you know, accents are relative and, and they pick it up. And, I think that, unfortunately, I see a lot of similarities between both states um, and both, and, and certainly in my research, it sort of reflects this aspect that it's very difficult for those who don't belong to the communities of either 
finding it difficult to get a foothold and to help uh, become an enfranchised and valued member of the societies to help move on. But what I'm also encouraged by is the fact that Northern Ireland has changed visibly. It has changed very significantly. Uh, I'm going to set aside my depression over where Lebanon is at this, particularly this year, and I'm sure that anyone who follows the news can find it. But in Northern Ireland, despite the fact that we have several challenges brought on by Brexit, fundamentally, it has changed in a number of different positive ways. And I think that it's worth holding on to, knowing that the communities are becoming more diverse, knowing the communities are, I'm not someone who, um, obviously with my own parentage and people can point that out, I, I come from a family of mongrel mix of the <laughs> variety of different people. So I'm all for um, the establishment of diverse communities because um, if we want to look at it socially and culturally, communities are enriched by, uh, by diversity and we eat better food and we enjoy each other's companies and more interesting conversations. And there are science that shows that diversity leads to innovation across in political and economic and technological advances. So I'm, I'm for the promotion of diversity. I'm also for the promotion of diversity, particularly in divided societies that have gotten used to pillarization of certain communities. Now, of course, does that mean that we shouldn't listen to um, the, the worries of other and more dominant communities? Of course not, we should absolutely listen to them. But what is important is understanding that those conversations, that just because the dominant community has a fear or an issue, doesn't mean that that takes primacy only over the political space and the social space. Because we have to create a community that is able to be lived in and able to adhere to values and human rights and, and wider rights that hopefully a bill of rights can deliver. And um, I'm excited to see hopefully where we can take this in Northern Ireland going forward. It'll take a lot of work, but co in comparison to the place that I arrived when I was around 11 years old coming from, uh, from Beirut, it is uh, it's significantly different and improved in, in many important and appreciable ways. Many thanks to Mark Donahue, Ola Sobierai, Liz Griffith, and Drew Michael. Visit our website, mmeconsult.org, for further details. Watch the series on YouTube, or subscribe to the MME Matters podcast on all the main podcast outlets.